Join me as we pray together for the Holy Spirit. Father, we must have your Holy Spirit, and we are confident of the promise that you've given to us, that you would give that Holy Spirit when we ask for it, to convict us, to open our hearts and minds, Lord. So I thank you in advance. Amen. Well, it's the third day of January, the new year. How are those New Year's resolutions coming? Huh? Not so good? <laughs> uh, this thought came to me uh, this week as I was preparing a sermon. The New Year's thing doesn't have anything to do with the sermon, but uh, human beings, you know, we, we, we make New Year's resolutions once a year, right? And we, we look forward to January so we can make that New Year's resolutions and, and change our life. Right, uh, and then you know, sometimes by the third of January or <laughs> a little bit later, that New Year's resolution has gone by the wayside. But it brought to mind uh, what uh, probably a lot of you folks know. It's in Lamentations uh, chapter three, uh, verse twenty-two and twenty-three. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Our passion for a New Year's resolution fails pretty quick, doesn't it? They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We don't have to wait once a year for God's passions and his mercy to be renewed. It's new every morning. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. That gave me courage for the new year and all the resolutions that I should have made and didn't. But uh, the Lord is there every morning. Let's make up our minds to meet him every morning. Well, it's a privilege and an honor to stand before my home congregation and speak. It's also really scary. Uh, I was speaking, talking to Alex a little bit uh, before we came out. Uh, and he speaks in other churches, and it's not near so bad when you, you can leave the church and you don't have to come back and face people in the next re week. Right, Melinda? Yeah, right. Okay, open your Bibles to John chapter 5, please. John chapter 5. Jesus was just nicely getting started into his uh, ministry. He was uh, going about and, and preaching and healing people. And uh, he was starting to get some attention uh, from the wrong crowd, namely the Pharisees and the scribes. Uh, they uh, kind of had their eye on him. And uh, we find in, in uh, John 5 that he came across the crippled man, crippled for 38 years by the pool of Bethesda. And uh, uh, just a sidelight here. If you go up in verse 2 of chapter 5, it says, uh, Bethesda having five porches, five colonnades, columns. For many, many years, people, the skeptics of the Bible had said, that doesn't exist. We've never found anything like that. So the Bible is wrong. It says there were five, and, 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 and that's not true because they, ju they just haven't existed. Well, uh, here in the last, uh, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 years, archaeology has really taken on. Guess what? They found them. The Bible is true. It is right. You can depend upon it. So anyway, here lay this cripple, 38 years, and Jesus came upon him. And uh, Jesus says in verse 6, do you, do you want to be made, made well? Do you want to be made well? Now, the guy could have made all kinds of excuses, and he answered. He says, nobody's there to put me in the pool. But Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk, just like that. Now, he, the man could have repeated that. He said, well, well wait a minute, i gotta, I got to get in the pool. But Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk, and he did. And it was on the Sabbath day, and of course, you know who had a fit about that. The Pharisees. And they said, uh, in verse 11, no, verse 10, the Jews therefore said unto him who was cured, it's the Sabbath, it's not lawful for you to carry your, uh, your bed. 
And the man answered, he says, who made you? He who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. And then they asked, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? They wondered who this guy was that would dare to say, take up your bed and walk on the Sabbath. So, and the man didn't know. He didn't know it was Jesus. But in faith, he had, he had done what he was told. So down in verse 15, we see that, uh, uh, well, in verse 14, Jesus ran into him again, told him not to sin again, at least the worst thing come upon you. And for this reason, they, the scribes and Pharisees hated him all the war, more. So who is this Jesus? Who does he think he is? Going around doing all these things and breaking the law on the Sabbath. Who can he be? The Pharisees had a record, you know, they had, they had studied the scriptures. They had a record of uh, who this Jesus might be. After all, uh, at his baptism, uh, the Spirit of God in the form of a dove descended upon him and, and said, This is my what? My beloved son whom I am well pleased. They had the Old Testament prophecies, which, of course, if they'd have believed those that had been there at Bethlehem, wouldn't they? But they weren't. Let's look and see who Jesus is. Chapter 5, verse... Now well, let's start reading in, uh, uh, in verse 19. We're going to read quite a few verses here. We're going to read through them, and then we'll uh, pick it apart. Chapter 5, verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now, verse 21. Very important here. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Who has power to raise the life? Who has power to give life? God, the Father. Who does he give it to? Who does he give that power to? The Son, Jesus. And in verse 22, for the Father does what? He judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Two things. He has given Jesus the power to raise the dead. He has given Jesus the power of judgment. And we're going to see that repeated because you know the Bible is progressive, isn't it? It just keeps adding on to what it said. Verse 23, picking up there, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him, remember that key word, believe. We're going to touch on that later. Who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Once again, we see the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and what? Live. He will impart power. He will impart life to them. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in, him, in himself. Verse 27, and he has given him authority to execute what? Judgment. Also, because he is the Son of Man. See, the Son of God has power to resurrect. The Son of Man has the power to judge. We're getting to what, who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. Verse 28, For do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Three times in these short verses we've read, we see the power of resurrection, 
receive the power of judgment. Do you think he's telling us something here? He's telling us who he is. He's telling us who he is. The power to raise the dead is the greatest evidence of the divinity of Christ. Because it's given to him by God. Because only God can create life, can't he? That's all. Uh, I've been reading a book about creation. And the theories that the evolutionists come up with are beyond belief. But it all goes back. It all goes back to where did that life originate from? Who was the life giver? Okay. These two things that Jesus has, that God the Father has given Jesus, the power of life, the power of judgment, make him unique. They make him, in the title of the sermon, the one and only being in the universe who has these powers. Would that be right? Amen. Okay. While he was on earth, uh, Jesus pretty much veiled his divinity. It flashed through now and then at his baptism, uh, at, his, at the transfiguration, and at his arrest. We, we saw flashes of his divinity come through. But he pretty much kept it veiled. Now, there's no record that, that I could find in, in the, the uh, material that I used for this sermon of anyone calling him the Son of Man. Nobody called him the Son of Man that I have record of or that I could find. And the Jewish le leaders certainly wouldn't call him that because of what we read in Daniel 7, that the Son of Man would appear. Uh, that would be admitting that they were wrong and he was the Messiah, wouldn't it? The disciples and the others just called him rabbi, teacher. It's most interesting that Jesus' favorite name for himself was the Son of Man. The Son of Man. He never called himself the Son of God. If you want to look him up, 80 times in the Gospel, he is referred to as the Son of Man. 80 times. He was human in his life. Everything he did about him was human. And even after his resurrection, he stressed his humanity. He, uh, he ate fish. He showed the scars in his hands and his side. If you look all these up, you'll find that 30 of them really speak to his humanity. 30 of the 80. He was hungry. Certainly Jesus was hungry. Uh, and he realized other people were hungry when he fed the 5,000. And I'll bet that Jesus ate last. What do you want to think? He fed everybody else first, even though he was hungry. But Jesus was hungry. He was thirsty. How about the woman at the well? He was thirsty. A human trait. He was tired. I know I never really found anything that said Jesus was tired. Uh, we know he stayed all up, up all night in prayer. So uh, being human, I would think he would have been tired. He told the disciples in, in Mark 6.31, let's, let's go away in the wilderness. Let's, let's get out of the way and rest a while. That didn't work so well because the crowds followed him. Jesus wept. He cried at Lazarus' grave. He wept over Jerusalem. He had those human emotions. Jesus was persecuted. Jesus was crucified. Thirty more times Jesus referred to himself in a judgment scene. Now we have 60 out of 80 that deal with Jesus' humanity and his judgment. 60 out of the 80. I think it's plain to see that Jesus is a judge because he was human. Isn't that good news? Let's look into that a little bit more. God could have judged us. Certainly, God the Father could have judged us. But to give us 
security, to give us assurance. He made it possible that we would be judged by a human being, by someone who knew what we've been through, who understand humanity. humanity. Now, I know there's a lot of people and a lot of talk, he did talk times, many times about, well, he was divinely human. No, he was humanly, human, humanly di divine. He was this, he was this. He could do this, he could do that. I'm not here to get into that. I'm not smart enough. Jesus says, you can trust me because I know you. I have experienced, I have lived what you have. Listen to what the Desire of Ages says on page 117. This really, to me, sums it up and it would end all those theological arguments. Desire of Ages 117. If we have, in any sense, a more trying conflict than had Christ, then he would not be able to save us. Let me read that again. If we have, in any sense, a more trying conflict than had Christ, then he would not be able to save us. But our Savior took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. We have nothing to bear which he has not endured. That's pretty simple and straightforward, isn't it? Pretty straightforward. That's good news. Romans 8.3. Romans 8.3 says... Uh, what makes Jesus our Redeemer is that he came in the likeness of what? Sinful flesh. And he lived a sinful life. Thus condemning sin in the flesh. He, doesn't, he didn't come as the Son of God. He came as the Son of Man. In humanity. With the possibility of sinning. We find more evidence of this in Hebrews 4, chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. It tells us to do what? To come boldly, where? To the throne of grace. Why? Because we have a judge who is tempted in how many points as we are? All. All points as we are. Now sometimes we scratch our head and... Boy, I don't know if Jesus could have sunk so low as I am thinking right now and been tempted with this thing, whatever it may be. But it says we were t he was tempted in all points, as we are. Jesus can do this only because he is the Son of Man. He has the power to judge. He has the power to resurrect. Jesus, in his humanity was never shy or ashamed to identify himself with humanity, with you and I, in all our sinfulness. Should we ever be ashamed to identify ourselves with him? No, we never should. He never shied away from us. Let's imagine for a moment that you or I, heaven forbid, got in trouble with the law. And we had to go before the court and, and a jury was going to be picked. And this was a special deal that usually, I don't know how many of you have ever been on a jury. Let me see your hand. A few of us. I've been on a couple. Kind of interesting, but kind of scary. But in this jury... The accused, which would be you or I, let's say we're on trial, got to pick one person on that jury. Now, that doesn't happen in real life. But let's just say that you got to pick one person that you could have on your side, that you knew uh, you could count on. So what kind of characteristics would you want? Uh, first of all, I think I would want someone who knows me personally, right? That's something you'd want? Who, who knows your weaknesses? Who really knows what kind of a person you are deep down inside? Um, 
I think of Nathaniel when Jesus called him. And they called Nathaniel, hey, hey, here's Jesus. And Jesus says, uh, indeed, an Israelite in whom was found no guile. And Nathaniel says, well, how do you know me? And Jesus says, well, I saw you when you were out there sitting underneath the tree. You thought you were all alone. And that just small little incident, Nathaniel says, my Lord and my God. Jesus knew Nathaniel. He knew him. I would want someone that when they look at me, they see themselves. Would that be a good trait to have in, in someone who is judging you? Who is on the jury? Uh, that's the principle of the golden rule in, in, a, in a roundabout way, isn't it? Uh, have you ever heard the saying, been there, done that? You all heard that saying, been there, done that? Well, here's a new twist on that. Jesus has been there, tempted, but he never done that. Think about that. Remember that the next time you just think that you're about to be overcome. Jesus has been there, but he didn't do that. And by God's grace, you and I can have the same victory. Jesus knows how strong that pull of sin is. And he knows our weakness. He knows how weak we are. Matthew 26, 41. When he was in the garden, when he kept catching the disciples sleeping. The spirit is willing, but what is weak? The flesh. What are we made out of? The flesh. He understands our weaknesses. He judges as one of us. In John 2, 24 and 25, a couple pages back, kind of a uh, summation of how much Jesus knew us. John 2, 24 and 25, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need of anyone that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. That's a pretty strong description, isn't it? He knew what was in man. And yet he was here as a man. Because he created us. Because he wanted to save us. Lastly, I would want someone who believed in me. Belief in someone, or having someone believe in you, is just one of the most powerful things that can happen. Uh... Spouses, we need to believe in each other, don't we? And we need to tell each other that we believe in each other. We tell our children we believe in them. Jesus believed in us. I have a list here of a few people in the Bible that I'd like to go over with you that Jesus believed in. And let's just touch on each one and see. There's, there's probably over 50. Don't worry, I don't have 50. Let's start out with the worst of the worst. Nicodemus. Puffed up Pharisee. The Bible says he was a ruler of the Jews. A ruler. That'd be enough to give you a big head right there, wouldn't it? He didn't have the nerve enough to come see Jesus in the daylight. He had to come see him after dark. So, you know, his image, his reputation would not be tarnished. Jesus believed in Nicodemus. What happened because of that belief? Well, I'll tell you what, if you look in John 7:50, Nicodemus during the court trial of Jesus, tried to stand up for him. He says, wait a minute, don't you judge? You don't judge on witnesses just one or two. And then in 1939, who helped embalm the body of Jesus? Nicodemus. He was a rich man. He probably paid for all the things that went into the embalming. That's what belief 
did for Nicodemus. How about the woman of the well? Woman at, woman at the well. When Jesus thirsted, the woman at the well. You know, she went to the wrong church. And she'd been married five times and divorced. And was living with somebody. If she walked in those back doors there, would we believe in her? Probably not much. But Jesus believed in her. Jesus believed in her. And he told her so in so many words. And she went back to the village and told everybody and came back. And, and when, Je when, when Jesus went and stayed there a few days, and when he came back through after some of his other visits, there were many believers there. You see what belief did? Jesus believing in the woman at the well did? Belief's a powerful thing. The paralactic at Bethesda, 38 years, Jesus just spoke. Jesus believed in him. He saw something. Even after 30 years of laying there, and his sins had got him in that position, Jesus still believed in him. Jesus loved him. Jesus believed in demoniacs. I don't know. I've never had an encounter with a demoniac. And I really hope I never do. But Jesus believed in him. Um, the scripture says in that encounter that they ran down the hills towards Jesus. And, and some theologians who study that sort of thing say that uh, they were going to attack him. Uh, so other ones think, and I believe this, that they saw something. Through their demon possession, they saw someone who could deliver them. They believed. Jesus believed in them. And even though they wanted to follow him, he said, no, you go back and tell what the Lord has done. And there'll be many in the kingdom because Jesus believed in, de in demon-possessed people. In Matthew 8, 23, no, excuse me, Matthew 8, 2 and 3, we see a leper coming to Jesus. Now, you know, lepers were unclean. And if anybody saw a leper coming, they were back off. The leper was to stay away. You read here, Jesus touched the leper totally against the rules. Why did he do that? Because he believed in him. He saw through the leprosy, just like he can see through the leprosy of sin in our life and healed him. The paralactic let down through the roof. He healed him and forgave his sins right there. He believed in him. He had to be a pretty big mess, too. The woman caught in adultery. It was a setup, but she was caught in the very act. Did Jesus condemn her? Did he even ask her? Did she even have to confess her sins? Jesus says, I don't condemn you. He's saying, I, You're forgiven. Go. He believed in her. Mary Magdalene, another woman of questionable reputation. Uh, she anointed his feet, you know, washed, washed his feet with her hair. And uh, Jesus said, what about her? He says, this story will be told over and over and over again. People will never forget this. Who was the first one at Jesus' tomb? Mary. That's what Jesus, believing in her, did for her. How about the IRS agent called Zacchaeus? Uh, hated among the Jews and the Romans because he was a traitor and a rich man and a thief, probably. Jesus believed in him. He believed in him so much that he invited himself to Zacchaeus' house for dinner. Come on, Zacchaeus, we're going to your place. Scrape something together. We're going to eat together. He believed in him. My favorite character in the Bible, Peter. 
Shoot from the hip, shoot from the mouth, Peter. Reminds me so much of myself. Shoot yourself in the foot. But Peter, because Jesus kept believing, Peter wouldn't even allow himself to be crucified right side up. Peter was allowed to preach at Pentecost. And last but not least on my list is the thief on the cross. Did Jesus believe in him? Absolutely. Did he have a list of good works and charitable deeds and everything? No. He just said, remember me. Remember me, Jesus. Jesus says, you'll be there. You'll be there. There's some scriptures I want to look at real quick. John 3, 15 and 16. Now you know John 3, 16. John 15 is, says the same thing. Jesus says that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And of course, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then over in chapter 6, verse 47. Six forty seven says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Thief on the cross believed in Jesus. All these others believed in Jesus because Jesus put forth belief in him, in them. And then we read it earlier. John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. My friends, if Jesus puts so much belief in us, what is stopping any of us from believing in him? Is there anything on this earth that should hold us back? That should keep us? Jesus believes in us. Please, please examine your life this new year, this day. What would stop you from believing in him? Not only believing in him, his simple belief isn't enough. The devil believes in him, right? Make it remind you not only to believe, but you live for him. That you might live eternally. Because Jesus is worth believing in.